Hello to everyone watching the School of Resistance. Today is already the fifth day we are streaming live from the Akademie der Künste in Berlin. And it's a pleasure to welcome here with me, connected from Italy, Luca Casarini and Lorenzo Marsili. And shortly also Yvon Sanier will join us. Perhaps let me introduce uh, the School of Resistance and also what we are doing right here. The School of Resistance has been founded last year in order to bring together experts of change. And uh, we have been discussing different topics along the last months, especially with activists, but also with researchers and artists um, regarding the suffering and uh, we're observing in the world, but also the strategies to remedy it. And especially here at the School of Resistance at the ADK, Akademie der Künste in Berlin, we are also combining it with discussions on questions of aesthetics. And today is a particularly interesting because we just had a conversation about aesthetics of resistance and now we're talking about the revolt of dignity. So we are really talking from a perspective of activism and public engagement. My name is Martin Waldes-Stauber and I'm one of the two curators of this series together with my colleague Kasia Wojcik. Perhaps let me introduce to you the first two guests tonight. Luca Casarini is an activist and publicist. He was an advisor to Social Solidarity Minister Livia Turco in the first Prodi government. In 2014, he narrowly missed entering the European Parliament. In March 2019, he led an operation of the ship Marionio in the framework of civilian rescue at sea when it picked up 49 migrants near the Libyan coast. And now he's head of mission on board of the Italian flag rescue ship Marionio managed for Mediterranean saving humans, an NGO. Lorenzo Marsili is a philosopher, author and political activist working for a future beyond the nation state. He's co-founder of the transnational NGO European Alternatives and he was one of the initiators of the pan-European movement DiEM25. He earned his degree in philosophy and sinology from the University of London and currently serves on the board of the global NGO Civicus. Always these introductions seem rather long, so I would like to turn quickly to my first question. Um, a book that impressed me a lot when I was uh, a teenager was Stefan Essel's Indignez-vous, so a book about uh, the personal indignations we feel. And I would like to start with a short question to both of you. What is the thing that triggers your indignation? Perhaps, Lorenzo, you want to start. I think we've gone through different historical cycles of indignation in the very recent past. And if at the time of Stefan Cassel, the main worry was to activate the social energies vis-a-vis -a, -vis a clearly unsustainable, unjust uh, economic, social uh, reality, today I think what worries me the most is a sense of despondency, even of despair, if you like, the idea of an inevitable collapse, an inevitable decay, a crisis towards which our collective agency cannot uh, apply any transformative change any longer because it is too late. I think there is a, a real risk of uh, depression as a psychophysical, psychosocial phenomenon building in, in, a, in a kind of acceptance of the status quo, which frankly we are seeing quite clearly today with the acceptance of the Mario Draghi government in Italy. Perhaps to, to pass on to you, Luca, also as a quote I, I prepared and I would like to share with you because also we have so many books lying around here. You see the disorder we are creating at the School of Resistance day by day. And uh, here I found this book of Artaud and there's a, one quote that I believe it's pivotal, which goes, I shall not feel fine, else I would rest and accept relief why things are bad. So what is the thing, Luca, that uh, you cannot help uh, seeing and which triggers your activism. Hi to all, and thank you for this opportunity, um, for this dis discussion. <clears throat> the problem is this, that um, I, I think that the first, uh, the first uh, thinking is that uh, there isn't an out of world. Uh, we are in one world. Uh, this word is uh, for for all is uh, the same word. We can stay inside the world and against the world, 
but uh, we not uh, we don't have uh, a possibility of uh, go away from this world and the, the, the problem is this uh, for me the problem is a concept of exodus in this world hmm. uh, we are inside the world is one we must stay against uh, the world of uh, injustice uh, uh, world of uh, uh, racism world of exclusion but uh, which is the street for exodus from this world and i think uh, the problem is this is a translation we are we have objective we can have objective and uh, the way uh, we, we we see look this objective but the way is the problem the the way of life the translation mm -hmm. uh, to the other world in this uh, in this uh, moment uh, there is a revolution i would i would like to to because now we talked about what triggers the um, the indignation and and I, I think you opened already up uh, a broad sphere of questions but i would like to return to the title of today's discussion which goes with the title of the revolt of dignity and i think the word of work dignity is something that is this, that perhaps we talk um, to less about, or we just use the words. So I would like to, to speak with you a bit about what is your conception of dignity and what importance does it have also in in our struggles. Whoever wants to start, I think it connects with what Luca was just saying. I mean, this, this capacity of worldling, uh, of creating the world, of in, it, it's precisely what uh, we are very much at risk of, of, of missing today. And that capacity of, of worldling, of creating an alternative reality to the one that is given to you, of course, speaks to today's topic, to the work uh, that we are discussing, because it is the task of the imagination to perhaps open up not only such visions, but to open up the space within which to organize, to materialize those visions. And that's, I think, something particularly important in the gospel that we can discuss later on. Uh, but in order to create a world that is other, one must be able to say no to what is given to you. And that capacity of saying no, to me, is central to the concept of dignity. It is Barclay's famous, I would rather not. Dignity is to empower people to be able to say no. No to exploitation because they have an alternative to being exploited in the factory or in the field. No to uh, racial discrimination. No to gender discrimination. No to a political system that disenfranchises even those who seem to be rather better off in economic terms. And so this capacity of saying no to the thought of there is no alternative, to, uh, of saying no to your predicament, to saying to say no to your exploitation is what triggers the imagination and the power to create another world. And that is for me a central concept of dignity, saying no and empowering people, giving people the capacity of saying no. It's true uh, what uh, say Lorenzo. And I think uh, it's possible uh, we have a vision of dignity in this uh, way. Uh, there is a first step for considered dignity, for, for construction of concept of dignity in our minds. The first step is indignation, is uh, um, in, the, in the Bible, the name is Splengizomai. What, what move us uh, for fight? Splengizomai is uh, love, feminine wo uh, mother love for the son, and uh, is a, a big, a big uh, push for not accept the injustice for the other. And the, in the second, the second thing is this: the dignity is possible. Uh, view the dignity only with the other. You have your dignity only if you consider the, the dignity of the other. Not is possible have the dignity, individual dignity, because, uh, or uh, alone, abstract dignity. Uh, the dignity, human dignity, is uh, a, a mirror with the other. If I can see the dignity of the other, I have dignity. 
if I not can see the, the dignity of the other, I not have dignity. I don't know what is. But uh, this leads me immediately to, to a counter question. Um, so are we losing our dignity because we allow suffering to happen? happen? For instance, uh, you, you were, are very active in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, there we see the suffering and not everyone is reacting to it. Or are we uh, on purpose not seeing these images in order not to lose our dignity? <clears throat> Look, I don't know if you I, want to. Yeah, yeah. You, you go. You go, Lorenzo. That's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, the Mediterranean, I mean, I always uh, bow to your expertise of that. Um, look, I, I, I think uh, dignity works a little bit like solidarity in the sense that, uh, as Luca was saying, it is empowered through this reciprocal relation. When I act in solidarity with someone, uh, take, for instance, solidarity within what used to be called the workers' movement. I work and I act in solidarity with a worker, with a fellow worker. I support their struggle. The same for, I think, the vast majority of struggles today. That solidarity towards the other uh, comes back as solidarity, in fact, towards myself. Because by engaging in an act of solidarity, I construct a collective power, a collecting energy that transforms the world in a way that improves my own condition as an immediate result. So there is this strange interaction of altruism and egoism in the concept of solidarity, whereby by leaning towards the other, you're actually improving your own existential, economic, social condition. In this sense, solidarity works a little bit like love. I think those who have children understand very well the pleasure, the happiness that one takes by seeing one's children happy. And that is at the same time an act of giving happiness to one's own children and receiving happiness by the, by the happiness that one gives. And this reciprocity of solidarity, of love, I think it's also and precisely the reciprocity of dignity. And when we turn away, as you were saying, from uh, all that is happening in the Mediterranean Sea, when we turn away from suffering, when we turn, turn away from exploitation, What dies is not only that which we turn away from, but is a part of us. And turning away is turning away from something that is rotting and decaying within our own very self. So it's not just a moral imperative not to turn away. It is also an egoistical imperative because that turning away is a turning away from our own internal decay. So for egoistical reasons, we should turn towards the other. Especially if we have, uh, if we take into consideration how the Europeans or the citizens of the European European Union would like to describe themselves, so then it's uh, even. Yeah, Luca, go ahead. Yes, no, I, I think pandemia is a good uh, experiment for know very well this uh, process of dignity. Uh, for example, and the word say Lorenzo now. Because <clears throat> pandemia and virus uh, ep epidemic situation demonstrating that uh, is impossible safe uh, alone in the world uh, <laughs> because it's a pandemia, it's a global question. And also, I think uh, racism is a global question, not, not is a local question or particular question uh, in our, our ship. In one moment, in the last uh, uh, mission, we have a panel and right in the ship, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, Black Lives Matter. And we are connected with uh, San Francisco, with Los Angeles, with uh, Seattle, with uh, the movement in the United States. We don't speak with the movement of the United States. We are inside, we have inside this movement in our action, in what we see on the sea, uh, because we think it is a global question. And uh, this, this problem, the pandemia, re make result of all, no? Economic uh, situation of, of the, the person in the world is the problem, not only the specific situation in uh, one town uh, in Italy or in one peripheric uh, situation. And in this uh, uh, way, 
we can uh, we can have a universal vision of dignity is a movement dignity not is an article of the human right declaration dignity is a movement is a, a, um, a have life like movement is uh, composed by relationship, by experiment, by, t uh, by um, crash, by um, successful uh, situation. Dignity is life, not uh, only a declaration in the, the, of the 48 of the last century or other declaration. If, if, if dignity is only declaration, is dead. It, dignity is action product. I'm glad that you're bringing up um, the combination of different struggles. Um, you, uh, as an activist in the Mediterranean Sea and the panel with uh, Black Lives Matter, and perhaps Lorenzo, this first to you. Um, in, in French, there's this notion of convergence de lutte, so convergence of struggles. Yeah. Um, which which is not that common uh, at least here in Germany at least I think the the and perhaps a question to both of you how do you see the potential uh, and how can we uh, achieve this uh, convergence of struggles bringing activists with different um, practices strategies and aims together yes and of course it's very fashionable to today to always throw in intersectionality and so on and so forth I think it's, it's, it's something quite old, actually. If you look at the way that Gramsci speaks about uh, women's empowerment, for example, it's quite clear since the 1920s why the struggle for the emancipation of women is deeply connected to the struggle for emancipation of workers against laissez-faire capitalism and fascism. And that is, in fact, how revolutions are made. We know very well that uh, Marx never predicted a revolution to happen in Russia because it was meant to be uh, a, a dominant proletariat that should have dri driven forward the next stage of economic development, not an impoverished peasantry in a country that was a uh, very incipient industrialization. And what the Bolshe Bolsheviks achieved, if you like, is a convergence de lutte. They managed to bring the farmers, the agricultural world, Mao Zedong did something similar, uh, within a, a revolutionary uh, movement, uh, within a, a revolutionary inclination. So th this idea of, of, of convergence is absolutely at the heart of all systemic transformations in history. And I think there is something dangerous at the fact that we even have to build a theory about it, because it's to some extent a kind of neoliberalization of struggle, where I can struggle for my own individual empowerment as if it were a separate compartment from the struggle of somebody else. And we go back to this idea of dignity and solidarity as being a reciprocal uh, approach a two-way uh, a two-way movement. So I think today, absolutely, the, the key and uh, the people who are working on this much more than, than I am is to tie in not only the 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 the, the, the logic of the, the the climate movement, uh, Fridays for Future, the anti-racist movement, so on and so forth, but to also tie in ways of organizing and mobilizing. And this is why it's very important, the flag that uh, Mediterranea has put on their boat, Black Lives Matter, because it is not just a question of theoretical convergence, it is actually a question of bringing together movements that can build the kind of momentum, the kind of force, the kind of pressure that is able to reignite a systemic transformation in our societies. We need something that is very much large scale to fight against what is 20 years now of political stagnation in our continent. And it's only going to be achieved by this kind, this kind of conver convergence. I think this is the terrain, actually, where theoretical and political investments needs to be applied today. Uh, I apologize for my bad English. Uh, I have a little dignity in my English, but uh, OK, uh, you, you can help me. You can uh, say no, Luca. Don't worry, you capisce tutto. OK. Um, I, I try to make a, a, a new a new vision of convergence. Convergence is the problem because um, uh, we we have power when we are all together. We have big power. It's obvious this. 
But uh, convergence not is, uh, uh, I, I think in the past, uh, we, uh, we try to have a um, system of convergence uh, uh, between movements, different movements and so, and not is uh, so easy one and is the past. I think we are uh, now inside a new world. For example, communication is a, a platform when we are together, all together, all the world is connected by communication, all the exploitation is, uh, uh, is uh, have a, a governance by communication. Our work, uh, our exploitation, our uh, of all in, in every part of the world. In India, in this, move, in this moment, there is a big movement of uh, farmers and, uh, and uh, workers of the land, a big, big, big movement. Uh, Myanmar, there is a movement against the, uh, against the dictator um, uh, pushship and so. Uh, there is many, many action, many moments. And I imagine that uh, this uh, human movement is a network. And uh, the problem, the communication is the kind of, uh, uh, for uh, the, the way for uh, have one organization of convergence. And uh, we must work very well in the communication, narrative uh, situation about our action. And action is the moment of attraction, uh, uh, attention for the other. And the, this problem, what, what is this problem? That uh, we for speak with the other, for have a relationship with the, other, with the other, we can speak from our actions not from from our words and uh, our words can have uh, uh, weight in the network and uh, can have uh, uh, can uh, exercise attraction for for the other if our action is uh, um, is strong no is uh, intelligent or is uh, is uh, strange or the other and in this way we have convergence is a temporary Convergence, limited convergence, but we are together. We 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 have uh, this uh, perception. There isn't a, a Howard X. We are now together, but uh, we recognize the other in the network. We in, in this in this way with action. We when we start Mediterranean, we say. Our words against uh, Salvini, against racism, against the uh, closed, uh, against the, the dishumanity of uh, uh, the dead uh, on, on the Mediterranean. Our words, our denounce, our uh, indignation uh, uh, by social, not is, uh, is, is like a, um, empty words. We need action for speak, for example. This is the way for create convergence, I think, and uh, for recognize the other, no? And, and the other recognize you. Yeah, once upon, sorry, just to, what Luca said, once upon a time, in a certain sense, it was easier, and I was mentioning Gramsci, but when you had a strong ideology, so Marxism would provide a strong glue, and there are very interesting debates uh, within feminist uh, organizing as to what extent Marxist theory and a structural economic understanding of exploitation through gender discrimination can be applied and to what extent it's an inf insufficient lens to look instead at something that is particular and not merely reducible to mar a Marxist analysis. But nonetheless, there was some element of holistic, overarching ideological glue that could help weave together those struggles and those energies. And that kind of ideology, of course, in today's world is no longer present, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but I think it is our generational task to imagine what kind of glue can be resuscitated in order to bring those struggles together, maybe in a way that is even more structural than what Luca said, which I think is absolutely necessary and still absent today to a, to a, to a large part. But this question of post-ideology for me, it's very much connected to this question. I'm sure we will return yeah. to that. And also there will perhaps even the concepts uh, we're talking about uh, today, like dignity, and also we will talk later about uh, the new gospel. Perhaps uh, the resources for such a glue uh, come from somewhere completely different, uh, as we might imagine. Perhaps it's not a, a hyper theory, uh, but something very uh, fundamental. 
I think uh, Yvon is now connected uh, to us and I hope he can hear us. I would like to shortly introduce him to our audience. Yvon Sagné yes, I can hear you all right. is an activist. Um, in 2011, he became the spokesman for the farm worker strike at Boncouri Farm in Nardo. He worked as a trade unionist for the Agricultural Workers Union and is one of the founders of the international anti Corporalato Association No Cap. In 2017, Yvon Sagné was awarded the Italian Medal of Merit, Cavaliere dell'Ordine al Merito della Repubblica, by Italian President Sergio Mattarella. In Milo Raos, The New Gospel, and we will sh sh for sure talk about this as well, Yvon performs as himself and as Jesus Christ. And I would like to welcome you, Yvon, and I hope uh, you can hear and see us. Hello, and thank you very much. I can hear you all right, and I'd like to take the opportunity to apologize to the audience, because in Italy, in particular in the South, it is not easy to travel around at the moment, so I'd like to ask you to accept my apologies to the organizers. But perhaps you want to share uh, what you were doing, because it's uh, very much connected to your work of activism. Yes, that's right. So I traveled to eastern Sicily because I was supposed to meet farmers there in the next few days, workers and farmers on the ground. So, and we are involved in a str struggle for a more equitable, fairer agriculture. We will for sure return to this. Uh um, to your work uh, later in the conversation, but I would like perhaps to start um, with the same question uh, that we started together here in this round. And perhaps I start, uh, I rephrase the question this time again, but with taking one quote uh, Milo said when describing the school of resistance. I quote, somehow it has happened that despite our intelligence and capacity for love, we live in a system of exploitation that will amount to destruction of the planet in the very foreseeable future. And although we know this, we do nothing about it. And I would like to ask you, Yvonne, what is your observation, what, in your, what is your indignation that uh, gives you the energy to work as an activist? Or to make, which makes it uh, nece necessary to continue your struggle? Well, of course, it all depends on each and everybody's culture. So culture is highly important, education and instructions we've all received. So we've all got our own particular visions and it all depends and hinges on education that we benefited from. And this is quite fundamental and material for us as we're now adults supposed to educate and train our little sisters, little brothers, younger people, so as to achieve a certain vision of the world and in order to convey also a certain world vision, vision based on social justice, based on respect of law of the constitution, also geared towards loving one another, charity and my uh, vocation is also a religious Catholic one as well and whenever I encounter injustice well I react with these values which with which I have grown up and whenever I'm faced with injustice and this is what I've experienced also here in Italy this is what pushes me forward this is what inspires me to struggle and this is my heritage uh, that I've grown up with and it is very strong it is rooted in my own personality and for me it's a Marxist vision that this has given rise to. It's also a Christian spirit that I'm inspired by and this is what in a nutshell motivates me to do whatever I'm doing today and my everyday business is based on all of this. This is some sort of a heritage that older people and uh, before me, uh, Thomas Sankara, Marx, Nelson Mandela also inspired me with. Perhaps we, we start um, to looking what you are doing, 
Um, and perhaps I, I have to, to rephrase in a different way, this, the, the context in which we are talking right now is a school of resistance. So let me ask you, what is your understanding of resistance? What are your strategies, your methods, your practices? Perhaps, Luca, you want to start also with regards to your work in civilian rescue at sea. Uh, we start uh, with this uh, action. Uh, we define this action uh, non not governmental action, NGO in this in this uh, sense. And uh, we start uh, because uh, we move uh, by the first uh, by indignation, because uh, there is a uh, in the October uh, in the 2018, the the maximum uh, level of uh, uh, pushback politics of uh, from Italy and the uh, European Union against uh, uh, migrants, uh, brothers and sisters that uh, try to escape to the concentration camps uh, to, to from from the torture, from the violence uh, be, um, through the Mediterranean, and they try the institution try to build a, a border in on the sea. And this is very interesting process because uh, construction of border is one of uh, the uh, one of the way for don't recognize the dignity of the persons. Mm. And uh, uh, in, the, in this uh, in this sense, you know, the, the discourse that I, I say uh, before, uh, the mirror, they don't want mirror, want wall. Wall, you not can see the person, you not can have the perception, you not can can have uh, uh, obvious uh, uh, denouns, you can, you not can have uh, valuation, you don't see anything. Is the modern way for the war? No, uh, is the, the game is like a game. Uh, the migrants uh, person that uh, walk for many many months uh, in the Balkanic route and try to cross the border uh, for for safety and uh, call this action game is the game is it like a game against the person and the, the result of this horrible game is uh, deaths uh, thousand thousand deaths and this dance is uh, like my son, not is uh, like uh, uh, strange people. No, no, it's like my son, my brother, my sister is um, uh, like me. Uh, I, I live in Sicily. I live uh, uh, 2050 kilometers from uh, the detention camp in Libya not leave one million of kilometers to from uh, from the this horrible situation this situation is paid by the italy by european union and try to uh, building a border on the sea this situation uh, have a contradiction because there is uh, international water there is international uh, uh, law uh, for the obligation to search and rescue person on the sea. This is international law uh, against the refoulement, uh, massive pushback uh, uh, from, the, from, from the state. And uh, they try to change this, uh, this law, international law, and we try to resist. But uh, in this action of res resistance with a ship, with action on the sea, we, we, we go, um, we don't wait that the, the people, like in uh, Roulette Russa, the people uh, safe uh, coming. No, we go uh, in this direction and we want to help these people to escape from Libya. Is like Auschwitz. I think uh, in the in the other history, not is the same. Uh, no, I don't want this, to make these comparisons. Yeah. Yes, but uh, I think uh, for us is very important to have in mind that uh, uh, European Union built uh, the, 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 the the possibility of have a European Union is linked to this horrible 
horrible uh, um, horrible uh, situation like Holocaust, or like Auschwitz, Birkenau and so And I think if we live in, the, in that period, we try to help the, the person that escape, that tried to escape from the camp. And it's the same for me now. On the sea, we go with the ship. We don't have money. We don't have uh, pff, uh, anything. But we have this uh, in, in indignation. We, we move from this and search, search link with the friends, with all, and uh, uh, pay the ship with the borrow uh, by Ethic Bank uh, with the project and go uh, on the sea in the moment, the, uh, in the, the maximum moment of this politics uh, from Salvini and other. Uh, uh, right wing uh, parties uh, action against uh, uh, against our brothers and sisters and uh, this this is very important because uh, we we know now uh, two years of activities on the sea we know many persons we know many activists we, in all, all over the Europe for this uh, we have now a network of uh, NGO with eight ships, uh, rescue and ship, uh, rescue, um, search and rescue ships, and uh, free uh, plane for monitoring, and mm -hmm. one uh, telephonic uh, control room, and we uh, we self organize the system for help brothers and sisters and resist. But uh, this is also project, mm -hmm. not is only resistance is also a new uh, vision of Mediterranean. This is very important. I also understand that you conceive resistance as something to restore dignity. And I'm, I mean, that's also why I uh, briefly interrupted yeah, yeah, yeah. you. I think these historic um, references are problematic. But uh, what you made clear is that we live in a European Union uh, which defines itself more by what it excludes, by what it make, makes invisible, than by what it makes visible in order also to, to have this re reciprocal relationship of, of dignity and of solidarity. And this is and the, Martin, the problematic. Martin, this, this happened the same also in the, in, the, uh, camp, in the land of Foggia, of Sicily, for the workers and even uh, uh, fight for this because the invisibility is the the first no for not don't recognize dignity because is not person not human person is only numbers yeah we will turn in, uh, in in short to ivan but first lorenzo perhaps to you uh, what is your perspective on on the word or the concept resistance and also what are the strategies of a philosopher and a writer regarding resistance? First, let, let me say that I, I think the, the work of Mediterranean and the other search and rescue missions is one of the most inspiring political developments of the recent years. I think we've all been part of several movements, of protest actions, of solidarity actions, but I think what we're witnessing uh, in, since a couple of years in the Mediterranean, the self-organization that uh, Luca was just mentioning, is uh, not only a great source of inspiration, but also a great source of good. And too often when you work in activism, and even more so if you work in theory, there is a kind of uh, sense of uh, helplessness and detachment from what you're talking about or, or what you're protesting about to actually your inability to do anything to limit or reduce the suffering uh, that you are addressing. And uh, Mediterranean managed to make the jump between merely advocating or protesting uh, to actually, even at small scale, reducing the gross amount of suffering that we're witnessing literally a few miles from the frontiers of the European Union. I think this is absolutely uh, a best practice that if we found ways of replicating in other sectors of, of, of political organization would be actually quite a, a powerful innovation. It's something incidentally that, that many groups in the past have done, including groups that one may not necessarily like, where support for the local terrain, for local communities was part and parcel of a political 
demand, uh, whether that demand was correct or wrong. It goes from Hezbollah to Mafia, actually. Uh, this idea of uh, actually helping in reality and not merely in, uh, in advocacy. Uh, then briefly, I, I think it's not so interesting now to philosophize too much, but I think uh, um, what, what I believe is that there is a risk of falling into a kind of tra literally tragic uh, uh, moment where the prophecy uh, of uh, a coming, a looming catastrophe, the line that you read from Milo Dao uh, just a while ago, um, becomes an, inev an, an inevitable uh, self-fulfilling prophecy uh, towards which we are unable to offer any resistance of sorts. And we are in the, uh, in, in the, in, in the role of a tragic hero who tries and moves and organizes and mobilizes, and yet you always get the next Draghi you always get the next round of slightly more decayed normality until at some point something cracks and the prophecy of the catastrophe is realized. Uh, I think trying to understand how one moves away from this tra uh, tragic inevitability is part and parcel of what theory should be applied to today. And for my part, it's got to do with the limits and I think the terminal decline of the national dimension as the dimension within which politics is organized and conducted. I think for as long as we politically organize, we politically fight, we struggle, we develop policies within a national level, there is always going to be a disconnect, a tragic uh, impotence of actually applying any agency, which means any human contribution to uh, a systemic transformation of this uh, world marching towards a looming catastrophe. So constructing transnational forms of organizing, transnational political forms, whether that is at the institutional level, at the level of cooperation that uh, the Red Sea and the, the search and rescue missions that Luca was discussing represent very well, whether that is connecting uh, migrant workers in Tunisia and Sicily to fight against Caporalato and exploitation, those connections, I think, are what will define our capacity to stop the prophecy of Tiresias from actually materializing. Thank you for that perspective. Then I would like to turn to Yvon. Um, perhaps you want to, to share also what are your practices, what is your form of, of uh, living forms of resistance, and perhaps you also want to um, go into the functioning of the NOCAP Association and the work you're doing there. Well, I come from a country and a continent that suffered a lot. So we experienced colonialism, imperialism, and our people, just like most of peoples have experienced, witnessed suffering, but also resistance as basic values, uh, as a basic value. And this is what pushes me forward in order to do what I'm doing right now, just as I told you before. No cap. Well, when I first arrived in Italy, I've all of a sudden realized how unfair the situation was, how much people were exploited, workers lived in unfair conditions, uh, high level of injustice, marginalization in society, workers working in a position to big corporations, but living off starvation, wages, meager wages. So this is what I recognized straight away, this injustice in the country. And then I did the maths, which was quite straightforward, the thing to do. And I just had to revive this culture and this value that I've had in myself, that was inherent to myself. I organized a strike in order to protest against this situation. But then I am a trained engineer as well at the Turin Polytechnical University. And there I also got to know about struggles, what form struggles can take. And I realized that we have to move on from protest to proposals. So moving on from just 
complaining about things, denouncing things, protesting towards something more concrete, specific, walking the talk, taking action. Of course, it is quite straightforward and justified to condemn things, but we have to come up with alternative solutions in order to make for a better world. It's not just about um, telling beautiful stories, but you would have to put those things into practice, into reality. And this is what I started out doing, uh, basing myself on the experience that I witnessed myself and um, being also an activist for agricultural workers myself. So I realized that today those that are responsible for workers' exploitation are not just caporali and farmers, but of course farmers and caporali also represent a bigger cause, the economic system as a whole. the ultra-capitalist system, that is, which has only got one vocation, which is the law of maximizing profits. And today we're faced with these huge multinational corporations that are active and that actually rule agriculture in the world today. So land is managed by just a handful of persons today, multinational companies in that instance. 10% of multinationals today manage almost 80% of the land of the agricultural land in the world. So what we find in big supermarkets where we are used to buying our food is just a ma provided and produced by those companies. And I told myself, well, it's no use to just struggle and fight against uh, the caporali and the farmers themselves, which are uh, at the lowest level, but we would have to move up and fight against the system as such. And this is what I geared my fight towards against these big multinational companies and supermarkets that dictate and impose their rules, that dictate prices for produce, and it's those people that decide about the price, about the value and what a tomato is worth, for instance or a kilogram of tangerines. It's those that, it's those persons who dictate their perverted system that they created for themselves because their law suggests actually, or according to our law, we would suggest that the producers from Sicily, from Calabria, from Africa, or from South America producing cocoa, coffee, and tomato. So our logic would read that these producers should be able to decide about their prices themselves. But we are now faced with a system in which it's not those people who decide, but it's also purchases that decide, so the system as such is perverted and illogical, and so we decided and I decided to make a difference, to change that situation with no cap. So what did we do? We decided to talk to the population on the ground and to the consumers also in this instance, because consumers have the power to impose their own rules, because if there is no such thing as an awareness on the part of the citizens and consumers, I mean, there are 80 million persons in Italy having to eat and drink every day and going to the supermarkets shopping for things. And if they don't raise questions, if they don't ask themselves about where the tomatoes that they're buying come from and how they're produced and how they work actually grown. If there's no such thing as a collective awareness on the part of the citizens and consumers, the ultra-liberalist system imposed by multinationals and big supermarkets will keep on explo exploiting persons, be it farmers, be it workers. So this is how we keep up our struggle and we're focused on the entire agro uh, food chain. It's from A to Z. So I'm starting from, of course, workers' rights. This is my foundation. A labor code which helps us to build up 
a fairer system, but what's happening today in the market economy is that the market dictates rights and uh, legislation determining uh, the value of services and products. And what we do is to impose new rights to, we want to push for a minimum wage, a minimum threshold that you can no, not actually undercut so that people can make a decent living. Because if you sell products at too cheap a price, it will mean that workers cannot actually live off their wages. So we take positions, we take a stance, and we go and see purchasers, consumers, buyers, and tell people, well, see, products have to come at a certain price because that would be decent uh, for farmers and workers. It would actually promote fair and equitable farming. So this is the technical part. We also introduced a brand that would help consumers and buyers to find orientation and to identify products and make a difference between products uh, derived from uh, an abusive system and from a fair system. So this helps to raise awareness, not only a philosophical awareness, but also material awareness, because we've issued our own products, released our own products with our brand sign, with our label. And this helps us to have a more participatory movement and to identify fair products. Thank you for, give, for giving us this insight and also for the audience you find information about, uh, with, if you search no cap association you will find more information on this and particularly for the German speaking uh, audience today if you go on the webpage www.dasneueevangelium.de you will find also further information on how to support uh, the no cap uh, association. Yvonne was uh, mentioning the, the personal responsibility we have as consumers, but also um, uh, in different structural elements of, of how, um, in, in which context we are moving, and the, the branding would be probably something in between mediating. Lorenzo, perhaps um, to you, what is the relation between individual responsibility and the necessity to actually organize forms of solidarity? How can we navigate uh, these two poles? Yes, I, I, I don't give a fuck whether you recycle or not, as long as you join the revolution is tendentially my attitude. But um, I, I think what um, Ivan was saying is very important because it's actually the way that capitalism has sold mass impoverishment and is sustaining itself vis-a-vis -vis mass impoverishment. It's a kind of compensatory capitalism where the compensation is tied to a system of slavery. This is not just something that happens in the agricultural field, but think what happens in the fashion industry. We have generations of precarious workers who are denied the stability that would enable them to set up a family, to know what is happening in their middle age and in their old age, who, especially in the south of Europe, face a future where even the right to a pension is being put in doubt, but they're able to go and engage in very high class compulsive shopping because we can sell for three euros, for five euros, shirts and garments at the likes of Zara, H&M, so on and so forth, which are made precisely with the semi-slavery conditions that Ivan was mentioning in the case of agriculture, but in the case of garment production, especially in East Asia. And we have a system whereby this compensation serves to keep the pretense that capitalism is working for a majority because you have some vestiges of what used to be a bourgeois lifestyle. You can buy clothes, you can buy tangerines, you can buy even strawberries out of season, and yet perhaps you're paid a mini job salary, your, your, your work is precarious, your pension is denied. So there is, I think, a very close connection between what Ivan was mentioning and the way that capitalism sells itself today at a moment when it's not delivering for, uh, uh, for, a, for a majority. And I think precisely uh, uh, to conclude what I Ivan uh, was saying is the heart of the matter. It's important to uh, shape one's own behavior in accordance with the fight that one is leading. That is not something so important to actually drive change in my mind, but it's very important for credibility. 
So it must be done in order to be credible with what you say and what you do. But it's not going to be an organization of consumers, which is too easily, too easily manipulated into the kind of bioeconomy that especially in Germany is thriving, that is going to lead change. Change requires political fights, it requires conflict, and it requires the capacity to attack the structural dimensions of production, precisely in the way that Ivan was mentioning. And we need to be able to say things that are unpopular, like some goods should cost more. You should not be able to pay three euros for a shirt. And then if the counter argument goes, ah, yes, but then poor people will be worse off, that is precisely the contradiction that one needs to break. Yes, that is the case, but that is why we need free and universal transport systems, for example, so that the money that one saves on transport, one can use to pay a fair, a fair cost for mandarins so that the workers can be paid themselves a fair salary. So it's this, this, this connection of an unjust system used to pacify social conflict and to keep the pretense of a functioning capitalism that we need to be able to untangle. Changing our behavior is key for our credibility to be uh, credible actors of a structural revolution, not merely enlightened consumers who are very happy to showcase their bio products in Prenzlauer Bank. No, I mean, uh, it's it's great how you're pointing out also that, that we as dormant consumers are part of an economy of suffering. Uh, and most of consumers are themselves uh, not uh, gaining from, from this from this mechanism, but they just are uh, uh, being compensated. And I also think it's particularly important that you're pointing out uh, how perhaps things are a bit different north of the Alps. Um, because I also feel that this question of um, personal, personal responsibility as a consumer uh, combines ecological thinking on the un other one hand and moralizing questions on the other. And moralizing uh, this question of how you consume also inhibits an actual political fight or discussion or questions of, of structural change. So this is probably a, a discussion we would need much, much more, especially here. And, and you are pointing Prenzlauer Berg, which is close from where we are right now. Um, now, I would like perhaps to, to switch to, to a different uh, part of our conversation. Yvonne, before, before you joined, uh, we were already talking about this, and the uh, next question would go to Luca, um, because we started to talk about um, dignity, and we mentioned the new gospel. Um, and I would like to ask you, Luca, what you see in this, uh, in this reference, which was so important for, for the work, which we will show this afternoon, the, the movie, The New Gospel, what form, what, what f notions, what forms of inspiration, perhaps also regarding to the concept of dignity we already talked about, do you see in this, in this text? How does it speak to us? I, I think we have, uh, is linked with the last uh, question, uh, the last time uh, also this, because uh, I think uh, we have a big problem of narrative of our history. Uh, narrative, uh, narration or narrative, uh, not is only one. There is a narrative of the winner, narrative of the multinational, narrative of the invasion of the migrants that, uh, okay, pu uh, push uh, the public opinion to sustain, for example, the close uh, borders, uh, Poli political action or other mm, inhuman uh, condition. And I say in the new gospel and one uh, thing very important, one uh, way, another way for write together a new narrative about our action, our action of resistance, our, our project, our desires, our dreams, and this, uh, this way is very interesting because it's a way to the future, but linked uh, with the old past. is a narrative of uh, one movement, uh, human movement, that uh, uh, is uh, complementary to the capitalistic movement, liberalis li liberalism movement, uh, and uh, power, and so. And I think it's very interesting uh, for us, uh, um, have uh, this narrative also about the spiritual part of our movement, not only material part. 
material is uh, uh, the condition material is the action material is the consequence of our action for example for us on the sea we go and material is the life that we save to the dead is an incredible action for me is uh, the, the biggest uh, in, uh, for my imagination no for my happiness but uh, uh, there is a, another part a spiritual part is very important that uh, in this world that uh, is a digital world we uh, uh, we we have also a part that speak about our the, the the quality of our relationship of our reasons uh, i think that uh, if i think that uh, 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 these persons that uh, uh, woman men and children that coming from libya is my brothers my sisters my not is a slogan is a particular vision of a relationship between human uh, persons uh, and is a particular vision also for the planet because climate change movement uh, anti-climate change movement speak about also um, pope francis speak about uh, the planet uh, the life of the planet mother earth this this problem for the left in par in particular is like heresia is like heretic when we speak about uh, spiritual situation but uh, we don't we i think in this uh, uh, in this time in this epoch we not uh, uh, have a fright about spiritual problem we move for something that we are we have inside don't all is uh, rationality there is a part uh, depends this part of of uh, uh, our um, s s vision of the world not is rationality uh, we we know that uh, if we stay together in solidarity and in love is better that uh, we stay without love without respect this point is very fundamental point because um materialistic uh, vision not is in contradiction with spiritual spiritual vision also and i say the i i look this in gospel uh, process and new gospel process and and for example in palermo in palermo events uh, and i i have a, a big uh, um, impression of this uh, courage for say this i have big impressions uh, uh, look uh, even like uh, jesus is very good because we we must uh, have a link with the history we fight not with we we are not alone we are we are not the first we are not the last then also to you uh, Yvonne what uh, does this this text the new gospel but also the project uh, in which you participated uh, mean for you uh, as an activist Well, of course, Miller Rowe has always managed to find an original way of approaching this complex issue at hand. And there are so many persons that um, associated this title chosen by Miller Rowe as a, some sort of provocation, the new gospel. So as if they there had been two Gospels, this is how they perceived this title. But I always kept telling people that the Bible is not just the only reference for Christians. The Bible today, well, we can say that it is also the biggest instrument for laypersons today, because if you look at what is going on in society, it, even things that laypersons experience go back to what the Bible says. Uh, Miller Rao is also a person interpreting uh, the 
Bible more than also self-declared Christians. It is, it, for me, it means more and goes beyond just going to the Mass. And Matteo Salvini often instrumentalized religion. And being a Christian for me is, of course, practicing what is written in the Holy Scripture, because the message that is enshrined in the Bible is a universal message. And it can be reproduced and reiterated everywhere, going beyond cultures, going beyond religions, and going beyond all of our origins. So as I told you from the outset, it is not just about what uh, people pretend to be as self-declared Christians, but it has to go back to what is written in the Bible. And I believe now what is still topical 2,000 years on, and I think even today, Jesus Christ would be close to the poor, to the impoverished, to the suffering, people who suffer, to migrants. To He would be close to those being exploited. And he would be also next to Italians, Africans, also in the midst of people. Jesus would be on the sides of the poor and not with rich people, just like it says in the Bible. The poor people are the ones that arrive in paradise first, not the rich persons. And Milo Rao found this original way of approaching things and to convey this message to everyone in the world, if it's the world of uh, believers or non-believers. He said that film, this film just states that those that believe in something, those that have the faith should not push back others, should actually not turn their backs on others, just like Pope Francis says. We have to be against racism, against barbarism, etc. So he intentionally addressed the Christians of today and wanted to also turn to the non-Christians to tell them, well, Jesus Christ was there. He um, was followed by the disciples. And even if you don't believe in him, he was one of you. He was one of us. And I'm telling it to you, trade unionists, for instance. He was also an activist like you. He fought for people's rights. He joined in the struggle. He initiated the struggle against the rich people of the time. And he stood up for the rights of impoverished people. He was an activist, a trade unionist, a militant person as well as you could translate this concept to today's world. And Jesus was all of that, embodied all of that. And the new gospel links up the religious world with the non-religious world. And this is the originality of Milorau, being inspired by what we're witnessing today, the problems we grapple with, with what happened in the past. Hearing all that, Lorenzo, and referring to the things that both uh, Yvon and uh, Lucas said, and before we were talking about the glue um, to, to, to bring uh, people together, to, to mobilize together, what do you think, uh, could this be an intellectual source for, for creating this glue? Or what, what are the intellectual sources a theorist would be working with? Um, Allow me to play the atheist in this in this group. Uh, I, I, I have a, a a view of the Pope that is similar to the view that I have of Mario Draghi to some extent. I, I think uh, uh, Mario Draghi's government today is unfortunately the the best option for the country at the moment, given that the alternative is a fascist government in two months' time, and that is precisely the tragedy. Uh, the, the Pope, this Pope, is possibly, with the exception of reproductive and gender questions the only truly left-wing international leader in the world. And, and that is also a tragedy, to be honest with you, because I would like this to be a secular <laughs> dimension. I would like to see many secular leaders at the statue of Pope Francis and not to have to go to the church. 
uh, which I think is an outdated institution, to find this kind of uh, progressive spirit. But as we were saying before, we live in tragic times, and so <laughs> there, there we go. Tragedy is, is all that we have to, to work with. But when it comes to the, to the new gospel, of course, I, I'm joking, uh, uh, just in part. Um, when it comes to the new gospel, um, I think, of course, there is... Um, uh, it's very hard, let me say that. First, it's very hard, and I think it was really... Uh, slightly crazy of Milo Rao to try and do a film on migration because it's very hard to make works of art that deal with migration today. That not, not, not only because there is a bit of an overdose of them, but because when one gets so close to touching human suffering for something that is immediately reified and enters a market, enters a star system, it's very easy to end up like Ai Weiwei with that picture of Ailan, which I think is absolutely the death of art and also the death maybe of the dignity of an artist. Um, but I think Milo Rao actually and, and, the, and, and the team and, and Eva Maria Bersch and all the team of the, the, the Institute I, I, IPM pulled it through for at least a couple of reasons. One has got to do what, with what Ivan was saying. Uh, the, 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 mytho the Christian mythology is obviously uh, an extraordinarily powerful influence, especially in the uh, present of our geographical area. So white Europe, the white West, it's something that we think is our own, something that defines our identity. And, and, and to collapse that in a gesture that really explains the kind of global realism that, that is also present in other works, uh, to collapse that with the question of migration, to place Ivan in the figure of Jesus, sends a short circuit, circuit of signals in people's subconscious, uh, maybe not the spirit that uh, Luca was mentioning, but certainly the, the psychic energies of people, uh, that triggers a, a realization that actually what Luca was saying before, that they are my brothers and sisters, maybe is actually true. And maybe it's something that I can begin to see by seeing it enacted in a story, in a myth that has shaped my own consciousness as a white Christian European. And that collapsing of these narratives, I think, is extraordinarily important and effective. Uh, and the, the, the myth of Christ is, has always played that role. It's, it's a myth that's been, on the one side, taken by the power of the church, uh, the establishment, uh, a kind of institutionalization of obedience. But on the other, it's always been an extraordinarily radical narrative. Uh, from, from Munster, I mean, in Germany, you know this very well, from the, 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 the Christian rebellions that merged with a social and economic demand in Germany, uh, in the, especially in the 1500s, so on and so forth, uh, are, are extraordinarily powerful. So it's important to take this myth and reclaim it in the way that the new gospel does. Uh, this is partly of what I would call a mythopoetic act of really working within and working through a myth in a way that reshapes it and hence transforms our understanding of our, our, our own position, our own being in the world, to quote another German. Um, the, the final thing to say though, is that I think the new gospel goes farther than that. It's not just rewriting uh, a myth or playing this tug of war or pulling Jesus towards the good guys uh, and not, not towards the other side, but it's actively, it's doing something I think is very important and very, and, and very innovative. Uh, it's actively transforming reality by engaging with it. And so the fact that um, the, the film works with uh, people who actually work in the camps and in the fields, uh, the fact that through an engagement in the film, those who take part, those, those who star in the film, take part in a process almost of political subjectivization. They are, uh, the film reinforces the political protagonism of really existing struggles and movements on the ground, to the extent that, for example, a, a house is built as a result of the mess that the film has caused in Matera and the connections that the film has enabled in Matera. This transforming of reality through the shooting of a film is, I think, extraordinarily innovative, goes a bit in the direction that we were discussing with uh, regarding Mediterranean before, of actually changing things as you describe them, uh, as you look at them, as you theorize them. Uh, and it's, for me, an actually novel uh, artistic form of expression, which in a previous joke with Milo, I, I, I called Hegelian because somehow reality is transformed by its description. Uh, what happens at the end of the process of shooting the movie 
transforms the symbolism and the significance of the movie itself ex post. So I think this is uh, uh, truly interesting, and I thought it was going to be a failure, and I was, I was happy to be proved wrong that it's still possible to do very interesting works uh, dealing directly with the question of, of migration. I'm happy the middle hour is not highway way. Doesn't take much. <laughs> we will turn to, to the questions of, of, uh, of ours at the very end of our conversation. Um, but I would like now um, to take the opportunity also referring to a question that came from the audience. Um, and perhaps, Luca, you want to be the first answering to it. Is, um, the question of the audience was uh, regarding indifference. So um, rephrasing it is how can we break um, the indif indifference surrounding us? How can we break also the bubble we move in? The people that are watching us now is probably a group that in some way is, uh, is, is defined and also... Uh, somehow closed, how can we confront others with, with your work, with your experiences, and how can we raise awareness or, or invite them to join our fights? Uh, it's a big, big problem, this, uh, uh, because uh, the power don't uh, make a simple uh, a action for influence the public opinion but uh, building the public opinion about uh, through the shock uh, uh, strategic uh, point no and uh, the power uh, not limit to uh, produce the public opinion directly but produce also the uh, your imagine our imagine and i think we must block this imagine uh, uh, with the two two way one is uh, concrete action uh, we 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 not can is in all all the all the the, the situation uh, uh, philosophic and political and uh, uh, debate situation or action on 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 uh, on camp on on the sea on the land uh, and the concrete action with project because action not is uh, a sporadic action like uh, demonstration and so is a way of life a way of life uh, is our life Th this is the point uh, the fight of Ivan and the other comrade in, uh, in Sicily or in Puglia or in other with no cap uh, process. Not is a episodic uh, situation, is a way of life, is a, a, a project of life, no? And, uh, and this is the, the point. Also, the, the situation in the Mediterranean is a way of life for us because uh, for many, many of us uh, is uh, all the time uh, now is uh, there, there are many activists that work uh, about this and uh, i think uh, this is a first point we don't afraid if uh, is uh, a, a concrete action uh, in the start uh, this concrete action probably is minority minority action close action and so and the other the other problem is uh, language we can we must use all the language artistic language uh, uh, poetic language, um, spiritual language. We must use all because for broke this situation of uh, closing and clave and uh, uh, description by the power about us about uh, our problem. And I, I think uh, this is two way uh, is good. And the other is uh, exchange with the, all the experience we must uh, force uh, our tendencies to stay at our home in our action point uh, we must force this with uh, change experience with uh, uh, now is very difficult with the pandemic but uh, the, the with the, the meeting for example physical meeting and uh, um, we, we, we discover the, the revolutionary property of a friendly situation, for example, no? mm -hmm. and different situation. I think it's very good if uh, even coming 
in Mare Ionio and um, in Mediterranea for visit and uh, speak about the experience of NOCAP and the Mediterranean go in the NOCAP situation and uh, speak with the other person about our experience and so uh, also it is very good this uh, experience of today for example I think uh, this is the way but not a fright because it's a way of life uh, we are we we are minority but that have vision majority mm -hmm. this is the point we think to the world for the world the other is majority but think only in their garden and don't not can have a vision of the world the garden or their uh personal interests or very particular yes, interests yes, yes. Or the garden or, or, or the suite uh, of the uh, big hotel and big uh, Trump palace and blah 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 then also to Yvonne the, this question of how can we break the indifference the blindness of others and how can we ourselves in our work uh, increase uh, the people we reach Well, I believe that indifference today is one of the major results brought about by the system we have at the moment, by the reigning system. So power stru structures that has filled us with indifference. And this is something also enshrined in our communication habits that fed and uh, nourished our indifference. Also, economic powers have oriented our actions and our beliefs, our feelings. So I believe that if you want to fight against indifference today, you would have to work towards acting on two levers. We need to focus on communication more on the one hand. We need to educate people, raise awareness. And on the other hand, we would have to try and change the economic system that we are faced with today. When it comes to the economy, for instance, when you have a student, for instance, Sometimes uh, students listen to um, uh, speeches, a speech that I held on modern slavery in Italy. And this student came up to me after that I gave uh, that talk and said that she now had more awareness about those facts and she, that this inspired her to join in that fight and to spread out the word and to reach out to other people. And she asked me, whether I could give her a hand and fight against exploitation. And when she asked me that, she also asked me, well, how are we able to find a product where we can be sure that there is no such thing as exploitation behind it in the production? And I told her, well, it's quite a hard thing to do. She wanted to know how can I go to Lidl and find out uh, how products are produced. But what happened afterwards is that this student that I'm talking about one week after came back to a supermarket thinking about what she bought. But the thing is, how can we avoid her to become indifferent again at some point in the future? We would have to change the economic system towards greater justice, towards better values to combat indifference on the part of individuals. So this is to say, if we don't manage to make for greater sustainability economic, ecological sustainability, it will be difficult. We've made a lot of mistakes, and now we fight against injustice. We fight in favor of persons and their social rights, their civil rights. This is the first thing we can do without uh, changing the entire system. If you ask 
a left-oriented person what type of an economic system he or she would want to have, they are going to give you all sorts of different answers. But this is one thing. But on the other hand, maybe this would be too abstract for people to truly understand. It's not specific and concrete enough. So the fact of having a fair economy, an equitable economy based on environmental sustainability, based on redistribution of the riches, based on decent working conditions, leads to a situation where people can change the way they look at their society. And on the other hand, you need to choose the right way of communicating to people. Silvio Berlusconi achieved his power in society thanks to his controlling part of the communication in our country. And he changed the mindsets of parts of youngsters, of parts of one generation in Italy that became a lot more indifferent towards a number of problems. I mean, there are so many people dying in the sea today, which has become quite a normal thing for some people, that it's become normal for them to uh, watch others suffer, because they've gotten used to this new consumerism model uh, by way of this communication type uh, following one program. But, so we should pinpoint communication in a different way today. But this, unfortunately, is not a priority in uh, our system, in, in our world today. And what I would like to add is that I fully second what Luca said. We have to join forces today. We have to pool our strengths. We have to be perseverant in our fight. We have to keep up the fight. And I did so when I was little and when I arrived in Italy as well. And I worked also in the section of the Communist Party. People got rallied, people joined forces, they worked together in communities and reached out to others that were maybe not necessarily the biggest intellectuals, but they were able to exchange and to join forces, uh, think about the system. And those people have managed to be inspired by those values, and this is what is also become a part of what we do in our generation today. Um, some of us have parents who did not go to school, who were not educated, who did not follow and have a higher education. They could not participate in debates and exchanges of that sort. But still, this is what we can do now. Um, but this is what we lack as well, unfortunately, and I'd like to conclude by saying that this joint fight is material, is essential. So the class struggle is something that is still valid today. We've got the class of the rich and the wealthy ones and the class of the impoverished. And it's about keeping up the fight, keeping up the struggle, not just taking to the streets, but to roll up our sleeves and to fight sustainably. And this is an element that will lead us towards uh, freeing ourselves and fighting against this indifference that uh, we're faced with today. And we took to the streets for two months. So we uh, in organized strikes. We organized uprisings in order to fight against the, the situation. Casarini, for instance. I mean, we need those people who are prepared to take up the fight in order not to fall back into this indifference that Luca just mentioned. Thank you very much. And I'm sure that also in the after talk, after um, the, the screening of the new gospel that we will have today, um, you will continue uh, commenting on these things. And something that happens all this week in the School of Resistance is that time is too short for really having the conversations at the length we would desire to have. And the good thing is that the School of Resistance is a hyper-mobile um, 
tiny object which can uh, travel around, uh, pop up, uh, enable uh, decentralized conversations, land something at a specific social terrain. We have heard how important this is as a practice, but then also uh, be mobile again for reconnecting somewhere else. And I hope very much that we can continue the conversation uh, that we are having right now at some different point. Also something I wanted to share because I'm, I'm so deeply impressed with everyone um, that, uh, that I'm talking about uh, and with um, th this week is the, the, like the personal commitment, uh, biographic commitment uh, everyone is giving. And there's one um, quote I had prepared for today from the actor and philosopher Mehdi Kassem who says, modern heroiz heroism means either standing up by your own example, your autobiography or shutting up. And uh, all of you are not shutting up, but you are standing up with your own biography. And, and that impresses me a lot. And it's now time for me to announce how the audience can watch um, the new gospel. Perhaps you have heard it is only available in Germany and Austria. Um, and you have to go to the website of the Akademie der Künste or of Schaubühne Berlin. So, uh, for instance, www adk.de and there will you you will find a description of how to to access the movie the same is valid for Schaubühne Berlin and uh, I can announce that the movie will be released in Swiss Belgium and Netherlands in April and also later on in many other places in the months to come and the last thing that remains for me is to thank the audience at home but especially also the three of you. Grazie a voi. Uh, Grazie. Thank you. I can say that if you want to watch it, you can say it. I can. If you want to watch it from outside Germany and Austria, you can use a VPN because after the revolution, copyright will be dead. So there are ways of moving, maneuvering. I, I, I guess that uh, some barriers have been built up. I don't know that exactly. Hope to see you soon. Uh, hope that we can have conversations like this all together in the same room. Thank you very much. Ciao. E alla prossima. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for my English. No, no, no. È stato bellissimo. Luca has that.